Hello, and you're all very welcome to Animation Dingle's The Big Picture for 2022. My name is Mark Cumberton from Jam Media, and I'll be your host for this event. The Big Picture is kindly sponsored by Jam Media. Um, so as always, the concept for this panel is very simple. It's six projects, it's six minutes per pitch, it's six industry experts and one eventual winner. Um, this year, we had a fantastic response to our call out for submissions. So we just wanted to say thank you to everybody who took the time to apply. Uh, six people have been selected to pitch their ideas today. And each pitcher, as I said, will have six minutes to share their vision and passion for their projects. We're a panel of experts and, of course, you, our audience. After each, each pitch, one of our judges will give a brief review and ask a question or two on the project. Right, and once we've completed all the pitches, our industry judges will break away to confer, deliberate, and choose a winner. So that winner, that lucky winner, will receive a six-month paid internship in Jam Media, and they'll also have a chance to pitch their work at the Cartoon Springboard, which is coming up later this year in October in Madrid in Spain. So now I'd like to introduce you to our esteemed industry experts and judging panel, so in no particular order, we have Peter Gall first up. Hi, Peter. There he is. I think you might be on mute, Peter, but we'll say hello. Yeah. It's only been two years. Uh, <laughs> so excited to hear all your fantastic ideas. Thank you, Peter. Peter is, of course, the Chief Creative Officer with DreamWorks Animation Television. Uh, next up, we have Suzanne Kelly, Head of Children's and Young People's Content in RTE. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. Really excited to hear your pitches. Can't wait. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, and we have Sarah Muller of BBC, where she is head of commissioning and acquisitions for Seven Plus. Hi, Sarah. Hello, Mark, and hello, everybody. Can't wait to see all your ideas this year. It's always so much fun. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, we have Nina Han, and Nina Han is SVP of Production and Development at Paramount Global. Hi, Nina. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Looking forward to the to the session. Thank you. And we have uh, Adina Pitt, VP, Lead Content Acquisitions, Partnerships and Co-Productions for the Americas at Warner Media Kids and Family. Hi, Adina. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Can't wait for this. Great. And last but not least, we have Orion Ross. And Orion is VP of Animation for Disney EMEA. Hi, everybody. Um, for those who are about to pitch, we salute you. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Uh, and chairing uh, our jury and coordinating the pressure cooker that is going to be the room, the, the, the jury room, is Alan Shannon. And Alan is Chief Creative Officer in Jam Media. Hi, Alan. How you doing? Hi, everyone. Best of luck with the pitches. Um, I've seen them all, and they're all brilliant, so you should be very proud and confident. And... Uh, yeah, look forward to seeing them again now and very shortly. Best of luck. Thanks, Alan, and thanks to all our judges. Um, so, look, we're just going to get straight straight into it. Um, we'll get started with our panel now. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first pitch of the day, and we have Siobhan Canino. Uh, Siobhan, are you there? Have we got Siobhan? Hi, Siobhan. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh, Siobhan is going to pitch her project and it's called Little Scout. So over to you, Siobhan, and best of luck. Thanks very much. Cheers. Now, so my name is Siobhan Cashino and my pitch is Little Scouts. Uh, so just a little bit of background on what inspired me um, for this idea. I was really lucky growing up that uh, my childhood was always surrounded by nature. I, I um, My schooling was as much outside as it was inside and learning about nature and having fun were kind of one and the same thing. So I wanted to convey that in my series and I wanted to make a series that kind of approached the subject of nature and learning with having fun. Um, so here are a few details about uh, the series. So the target audience are upper preschool ages, episode lengths around seven minutes, uh, and the themes are of nature, discovery, adventure, and friendship. So these are our three main characters, Poppy, Aisha, and Ronan. They're best friends, uh, but their personalities are all quite different. 
So Poppy is kind of a giddy, cheerful, boisterous character. Aisha is a bit calmer. She's more, she's caring, responsible, and positive. And Ronan is a bit shy, but despite this, he's very brave and he's very creative. Every day, the three friends meet in the playground and they gather by the big old oak tree at the back of the playground and play make-believe games. And whilst they play, certain questions arise about nature and the world around them, such as one day when they're pretending they're penguins and they know there's a penguin called an emperor, peng an emperor penguin, um, they wonder, oh, is it actually an emperor penguin? Um, soon as they stumble upon a question like this, the oak tree starts to shimmer and a voice, in, in, and a voice inside it invites them in uh, to discover the answer to their questions. So they gather inside the oak tree and they're whisked away. And here comes in our next main character, Wisp. She's the spirit of the tree. She's wise, sassy, good humored, and she's going to lead the children on their adventures. As well as this, she has magic powers. And in each adventure, she can grant one wish to every child. So here they are, for example, in Antarctica to discover about the emperor penguins. Um, and Wisp is leading them towards them. But Aisha spots something in the distance and she can hear a kind of a cry for help. Being the responsible one, she decides to use her wish. And she asks Wisp for a pair of binoculars to see what's happening in the distance. And she spots a little penguin chick in trouble. So they all rush, they all rush and find a little penguin chick needing help. And um, Ronan, being brave, has a think about what he could wish for to help the penguin chick. And he asks for a rope. He climbs down the hole and helps the little chick. They go on their way and they notice they find the penguin colony, but it's so far away and they're up really high. So Poppy has a good think now. And being always up for a laugh and playful, she decides to ask Wisp for a sleigh. And down they go. Once they're down by the colony, there's still another little problem. They don't know which, par which penguins are the chick's parents. But Wisp informs them that little penguin chicks make a noise that only their parents can recognize. So in no time, the, the chick finds his parents. The children then learn that emperor penguins aren't actually emperors. They're just the heaviest and biggest penguins. Um, and their adventure finishes now and they zoom on home, back to the playground where they call their own parents and guardians who wonder about what they were up to really. Um, and the, penguin, the children say, oh, we learned all about penguins. We were in Antarctica. Peng the parents say sure, but can't explain the little bits of snow in the children's hair. So these are some extra details. Uh, the children can return to the same locations more than once and learn about different things that li either live there, plants that grow there or, or other natural phenomena. Um, there's always an ele element of resolution to their adventure. And when they get back to the playground, there's always a little nod referring back to their adventure. And here are a few episode ideas. So they could, I, they could go to the moon, learn about gravity, the solar system. They could go to the desert, learn about how camels can survive there with no water for so long, learn about really rare de desert plants that grow there. They could even just stay in a garden and learn how seeds grow. In this little bit of concept art here, they're in the rainforest, uh, learning about an endangered lizard. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Siobhan. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for that. Thanks for the lovely presentation. Um, I'm going to ask Nina Han of Parliament Global to come in and review and give some comments on your on your pitch. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, great. Listen, it was a lovely pitch, and um, it's really difficult to do that in six minutes. So. 
you did a really good job in, in, in six minutes, beginning, middle and end, knew who the target was, what the episode orders was. And I think what was really lovely, and you don't often see this in pictures, so it was quite a, a nice um, added element, was for you to begin by saying what inspired you, because I think that really humanizes it, it really grounds it. And for all of us who hear a lot of pitches it, pitches, it makes us realize kind of what you love about it, which will henceforth be what we love about it, and hopefully the audience uh, loves about it. Um, I think also um, you did a really good call on the seven minutes because often people push to 11 minutes or 22 minutes. And sometimes a simple story is really best, best told in seven minutes. And it feels like the legs and the, the sort of classic simplicity of the, the way you're trying to weave together nature and learning and fun um, would suit a, a seven minute story, um, you know, really nicely. Uh, I think also from a commercial perspective, the fact that you've mentioned that they can revisit multiple locations is quite interesting because obviously from a production perspective, uh, doing a show, which is in a different location every single time, uh, can pose quite a, um, ambitious budget ask. So, uh, it's interesting for you to think about that aspect, even at this early stage of the pitch. Um, some questions that I had personally would just be starting with um, who is the voice or who is the tour guide? It's, um, it's interesting to do a story that has you know, a bunch of characters at your center. But then again, asking you how you would answer, who am I at home? And who is this person? I said, okay, I just want to jump out of this couch and I just want to stand next to Poppy or you know, be with Aisha or be with Rowan because that person is just like me which then gives you sort of leeway to really caring about the character and, and what, they, what they want. So I was sort of curious if you had any thoughts about were you honing in on one or is it a trio at all times? I think it's a trio. I think they all kind of complement each other. And even when they're on their adventure, they kind of all need each other and nearly rely on each other's personalities to get through. Um, so I think it's a trio of characters, yeah. Good. So it's, it's as you go forward in that lane, it's quite helpful to make sure that as a trio, just like you said, they, they work differently, but as a, as a whole together, you know, so even doing exercises, like you give them each a lemon and what would they do with the lemon to make sure that each one of them is very different in terms of how you write across, across yes. an episode. Um, and the only last thing, I don't know where I am on the clock. Am I at six, am I at four minutes yet? <laughs> Probably like I'm talking about. Right oh, no, you have plenty of time. You're, you're okay. Good. So the only other thing um, I always think about um, entertaining in your story structure is just really answering the question of why Poppy, Aisha, Ron, whomever it is who has the desire to understand about a penguin or whatever it may be, why they want to do that. What motivates them to wake up in the morning and want to go search out the answer to a question versus the, the, the question kind of popping up to them and them reacting to it. Um, and often it's a small, you know, button at the beginning and at the end, that bookend your trajectory so that there's actually some sense of an emotional ticking clock for that, that character. And you at home then really root for them to succeed and to, you know, kind of get what they want to get. Um, so that it feels more than just every episode there's a question and an answer. Um, it might it might sort of engage. It might uh, sort of uplift on engagement, uh, you know, a bit more, which which you know is is really nice. Um, it sounds like you've got a really good sense of how you grew up in here, and it sounds like there's some personal stories in there that have been sort of blown out to to support the episodes, which is really nice. And and I would say really go for that and and find a writing voice and a and a production partner that will help lift that up. So I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that or, or how to produce it. Um, and lastly is how you've done, how you think about global, how you look at this project from a global lens and does it feel global? Does it feel relevant to sort of every culture and all cultures? Cause that will also help in your, in your development process. Yeah, uh, I definitely thought of all those things. Yeah, Good. I, I feel like it's, it has the potential to be global you know because of where they travel to and what they do and that we all live on the same planet so and kind of even though we live in different places we still kind of experience nature the same way you know that's great um, yeah. great well well done i thought it was really really charming and really um great visual style and just it made you smile thanks very much <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, Siobhan, and thank you, Nina, for your comments. That was that was very good. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Lauren DeSalvo, and Lauren's project is called Maeve on a Mission. Are you there, Lauren? Yep, you're now. 
Okay, over to you, Lauren, and best of luck. Perfect, thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Lauren. I'm a fourth year student at Limerick School of Art and Design. And this is my pitch for Maeve on a Mission. I hope you enjoy. So growing up, I've always had a love for Irish myths and legends. And in particular, I've always had a love for Irish mythological creatures, such as the Banshee, who's the heraldess of death, or Doolahan, who's the Irish equivalent of the headless horseman. I also very much enjoy the story of Grace O'Malley, otherwise known as Granny Whale, who was the pirate queen of Ireland. And these were my main inspirations behind Maeve on a Mission. Irish culture and language is also very important to me, so I wanted to keep these in mind while coming up with my ideas and find ways to promote them. So although the series will be told in English, some Irish phrases and sayings will be sprinkled throughout. Maeve on a Mission stars Maeve, and Maeve is a very headstrong, daring teen with a wild imagination. She is 15 years old, and she lives with her mother in Westport, County Mayo. Her hero is Grace O'Malley, or Granny Whale, the Pirate Queen of Ireland, um, her father passed away two years prior uh, to when the events of Maeve on a mission take place. However, she has very fond memories of the days that he would take her out on his fishing boat and tell her the tale of Grace O'Malley. She found these stories to be very fascinating and inspiring. So herself and her father would often play pretend that they were pirates out searching for treasure along the coast. And these days out really shaped the person she became. Maeve's mother Lorraine runs a small bakery and Maeve has always been more than willing to be her guinea pig for new recipes. So one day Maeve learns that her mother's business is struggling and in danger of shutting down. She overhears her mother speaking about the closure of the bakery on the phone and she wants to help prevent this. So she puts together a plan to gather some funds. She remember how herself and her father used to search for the lost treasure of Grace O'Malley. She goes to the attic and searches for an old map that her father drew up. He claimed that this map led to the treasure of Grace O'Malley. Uh, with the map in hand, Maeve sets out on an adventure to recover the lost treasure. Joining her is a young girl named Tina. And Tina has only recently moved to the area and she is in search of new friends and adventure. Tina meets Maeve in the very first episode. As Maeve sets off on her journey, she steps out onto the footpath without looking and is immediately hit by Tina on her bike. So to apologize, Tina gives Maeve a lift to the first destination on her map and ends up getting swept up in the journey with her. Tina is very curious and loves learning new things. She's less impulsive than Maeve and is more level-headed of the duo. So she often stops Maeve from running into situations without a plan. Also joining them is Maeve's loyal companion, her dog, Maisie. Maisie is a clever dog who stops the girls from getting into too much trouble on their adventures. She tends to be the brains of the operation. On their journey, they come across many strange and wonderful creatures from Irish mythology, from a playful puka, which is a shape-shifting creature that likes to play tricks, to a banshee who allows them to ask her three questions. Number three is considered a sacred number in Irish mythology, so this will appear quite often. These creatures will either seek to hinder their journey or may be able to assist them on their quest to find the lost treasure. But will Maeve's wild imagination and sense of adventure be enough to save the bakery? In terms of episode structure, in each episode they will meet a new creature and the episode arc will revolve around defeating or working with this creature to reach the next destination on their map. So in each episode, they explore a new area, each time getting closer to finding the treasure. It will be aimed at children aged 8 to 11 and consists of 26 episodes that are each 11 minutes long. To give you a brief episode breakdown, in one episode, they enter an enchanted forest to try and locate a key that they will then be able to eventually use to open a treasure chest. When they enter the forest, they come across a friendly horse who offers to help them search, but unbeknownst to them, this uh, this horse is actually the puka, a shape-shifting creature who can often take the form of a horse. These creatures are known to be tricksters and they often deceive people. So Maeve is immediately very trusting of this horse, but Tina is a little more cautious. When they eventually locate the key, the horse betrays them and makes away with the key for himself. However, Maeve, Tina and Maisie are able to work together to lure the horse into a trap and retrieve the key from him. So with the key secure, they can then move on to the next location on their map and continue their quest. Each character they come across will have their own magical, whimsical quality. So as well as this, each location they visit, whether it be the forest, the caves, or the beach, will almost be a character in itself. Each location will have its own personality and aesthetic. And for these reasons, I think this TV show will really lend itself to animation over a live action series. Main themes that will run through Maeve on a Mission are friendship, acceptance, and overcoming challenges. 
The series aims to inspire a love of the Irish language and to make learning Irish a fun experience. You know, at school, Irish was never my favorite subject. However, after leaving school, I really came to love the Irish language. So I think having a TV show like this for a young audience that promotes the Irish language will also inspire a love for it. Uh, it also aims to teach children about the history of Brace O'Malley and Irish mythology. The series isn't just aimed at children in Ireland, it will also draw in an international audience. Myths and legends have always been an enjoyable and entertaining way to pass on values and lessons, no matter where you're from. And this series will share some of Ireland's favourite myths and legends and the lessons that come along with them. And who knows, maybe in a second season, Maven the gang will be able to introduce us to even more creatures and other Irish historical figures, such as poet Oscar Wilde, St. Patrick or Hugh Cullen who will be able to supply them with new quests and adventures. And that's my idea for Maeve on a Mission. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you for listening. To Sulugun, Gervon Shiptanu, Fasun Gurilahar, with Gurv Makwiv, Elsegeish Doklum. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for sharing Maeve on a Mission with us. Um, I'd like to ask Peter Gall of DreamWorks Animation Television to come in and make some comments. Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, thanks for the pitch, and I'm glad that you uh, said the title up front because I would not have been able to pronounce it at all. <laughs> um, really well done. I, I have to say my favorite thing about it is the cultural specificity you brought to it. I think that's kind of the superpower of this is that you want to tap into real mythology um, and real kind of the cultural specificity of that and that it clearly means something deeply to you. So that's always a great place to start from in terms of your storytelling. Um, uh, and, you know, some of the, the elements of it are classics that will be interesting to everyone. I mean, everybody loves a treasure map, <laughs> uh, a great journey, the type of the specific mythological creatures you'll meet along the way that tie into things you learned in your childhood. I think that's all really powerful. Um, in terms of the, some of the practical stuff, the, the eight to 11 year old demographic as a demographic is, I, I think is a little bit tricky um if you're talking about speaking to a global audience um and it's different in different parts of the world but i think a lot of kids have been aging out of animation a little younger and so i think that 10 11 year old is is you're going to limit your audience a little bit so i would almost try and focus this on more of a six to nine year old audience um i think you'll find a bigger audience and your message and your characters will will have more resonance there um, I think one of the challenges you'll have as you take this to the next level is it's a balance is how do I have the cultural specificity and all the touchstones and the language and still really make it work for a global audience? That's just a question of balance. I think you can find that balance um, because in order to you know get it eventually hopefully funded for a global audience, it's got to feel universal. So um, I, I think you're already thinking along those lines. Um, you know, one thing I would think about a little more is the question of a new creature every week, because sometimes that can get a little, uh, exhausting. Um, sometimes it's great to introduce, have five or six key, key mythological creatures that you get to know better, that you go back to and build relationships with, and that become either part of the team or part of the journey in a, in a, in a fuller way. So that um, especially as more and more shows are going into streaming uh, versus broadcast, I think when when you feel like you're there, there's more connective tissue from episode to episode, and you're following characters that you built relationships with, rather than just the episodic new character each episode, um, that would be great. You've already got the the overall journey and the built-in treasure map and the things you're following, so I think uh, you've got a lot of that covered. Um, the other thing is, I think the, the, currently the design style of it is very unique. I think it probably does go to the older end of the audience, mm -hmm. the, um, the, the particular style of it. And I think you might want to try and find a way to take your style and, um, soften it a little bit and make it a little younger, a little more, um, uh, like emotionally connective in terms of the characters, in terms of eyes, in terms of being able to form a deeper emotional connection to the characters. I would look at that. Um, but I really, I, this is a show I would be very intrigued to watch. And I think, um, once again, I think you've got a great built-in journey that's built for a serialized streaming experience. Um, and 
the the cultural folklore is really fascinating. Um, I don't know, if Sarah, if you have anything to add or. Hello, sorry, I couldn't find the mute key. Lauren, that was wonderful. That was such a good presentation. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I was thinking about, so I think Peter's nailed all of it and using loads of really clever words and great phrases that I wish I could think of, but I can't at this point. I think for me, it's just about ordering everything to make sure the story really makes sense and that we're really drawn into it. And I also wondered, so like Peter, I think I would have said, let's try and do more with the legendary and magical creatures. Let's really get to know a core group. So we've got a way of extending the world. But also I feel that you might need to look at a slightly wider cast of characters outside of our two leads and Maeve's mum. Uh, because I think you're just going to need that because I think if you're not careful, the fantastic could become quite commonplace quickly and you don't want that. So you need to make sure you've got your root in everyday life because she's an everyday girl, however old you decide to make her. I think Peter said 15 feels a little bit old for me, for the audience that's likely it's likely to resonate with. I think they could both come down in age, which makes it much more fun and adventurous because, you know, they're off doing things, they're investigating. Um, part of, you know, adventures, it feels quite strong. So then you've got your, then your lovely solid base to build from, which is your everyday life that all kids recognise that has something to do with home and school. And then you can start to, to weave in these fabulous, am I allowed to say real legendary creatures, but you know what I mean? <laughs> Actual legendary creatures. And really, so it really feels special. I mean, I think if I'm going to use an example, it's Harry Potter. If you think about how they take things that are really recognisable and just start to bring in un elements of a different, way of looking at things because there's and I, but I would also like to know I think this is the thing sorry it's taken me a while don't don't tie me out about Grania Wow or whatever she's called the the pirate queen I'd like to know where she is in the story and I don't know if I missed that bit she's such a big influence and she's really exciting I would have loved to have seen a character like that when I was younger I'd like to see a character like it now to be honest I mean how exciting is that so if there's any way of perhaps bringing that character in she's not there, she wasn't anywhere too much in the pitch just she's an inspiration that is that right yes yeah, so they're basically looking for her lost treasure well I think you could have there could be room to tell her story or bring her in in their imagination or because that's really kick-ass and impressive I I think sorry Maybe I just like pirates. Sarah, I'm <laughs> going to have to cut you off. Apologies. I know, but well done. <laughs> thank yeah, you. No problem. At all, no problem. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, Peter and Sarah, for your comments. Um, I'm going to move along to Sean Drew. Uh, Sean, are you with us? I'm with you now. Hello. Sean, has, his project is called The Error. So over to you, Sean, and best of luck. All right, then. I'll just... Um share my screen and try to build up the uh, anticipation towards my big reveal, if you don't mind. All righty then, hang on. Oh, one more thing before I do. Uh, okay, I click here. And now, here we go. There is a strange and mysterious force that lurks in the flawed society of the Midnight Village, affecting that which children cannot part with, its technology. Some are unaware of its presence, others disregard it as a myth, and those that do know of it scream out in terror, but there is no running from. The error. <clears throat> now, if you'll excuse my terrible impression of Rob Sterling. Hello, I'm Sean Drew, and basically The Error is a spooky but comedic animated anthology series centered around teaching children about the use and misuse of modern technology. Now, basically in the Midnight Village, a strange force creates monsters, ghouls, as well as strange phenomena 
out to the various forms of technology. And the only ones that are aware of it are children. Go figure. <laughs> Basically, this series intends to be designed to suit and appeal to children aged 8 to 12. And in almost every episode, we open with our hero and the problem he's going through. We are then encountered with the monster that's related to the problem. The issue is eventually resolved, and a lesson is learned relevant to the themes of the episode and the series. Maybe with a little twist at the end, something very similar to Goosebumps. Now, in terms of the tone of the series, it tends to be only as dark and scary enough for the intended audience to handle, while also having a healthy balance of a silly, lighthearted, and over-the-top absurd humor. Now then, before I go any further, let's have a little look at where all this came from. Now, I grew up with a lot of weird, dark, macabre, but whimsical cartoons, whether it be the works of Tim Burton show or shows such as Goosebumps or Grizzly Tales. They seem to be my preferred style as they seem to capture my imagination greatly. Now, during my postgraduate studies, I attended a part-time course in cyber psychology, where I've learned a lot about the common traps associated with the misuse of modern technology, a concept which I've grown to believe children should have more of an understanding of. During the early days of the pandemic, I signed up for the masterclass course on writing for young children, which was taught by none other than R.L. Stein, the author of Goosebumps. Now, one of the assignments I had led to the idea of a video game that slowly turns a young boy into a monster. As I developed the story, I kind of embraced the idea of a whole supernatural twist on the misuse of technology, which sparked the imagination for a while, one thing led to another, and it developed into the uh, cartoon idea that you see for you today. And now, the players have arrived. Now, while this intends to be an anthology series, I also, you can also expect to find a consistent set of characters swapping around the roles of main and side characters. But at the same time, I also intend on having these guys share the role of protagonist. First, we have Sam Stein, an awkward introverted young lad with a minuscule social life and a video game addiction. Then you have Sally Smith, an A student by day, but at night, she is the mystery obsessed blogger, CurieSal92. Then you have Dart Baxton, a trickster in the online world, whose mischief always ends up coming back to him. And of course, we have a colorful set of characters made ready for action. Some will serve specific plot functions like this exposition. Some will help flesh out the Midnight Village further and others will provide the occasional bit of comic relief. But of course, a hero is only as good as its villain. And these monsters help build that world greatly. This includes a Frankenhack monster, a were robot, and Mr. Anomatous, the sneaky computer virus. And now we set the stage. To your left, we have the Midnight Village, an old Irish village that has a massive cityscape crash land right in the middle of it. This city has all the facilities, including a, a cinema made to resemble a circus, an extremely old fashioned school, a technological, um, a technology based corporation, a small comic book store, and a technological institution that in no way looks like a UFO in disguise. We swear. Naturally, I have, I've had more than a few ideas for potential episodes, but for you fine people, I'm presenting the absolute best. And we open with the one that started it all the haunted video game. Our troubles begin with Sam Stein playing a peculiar old game called Monster Mischief Madness. Soon news starts to spread of a monster that's causing trouble in the city at night, as well as signs of him being the same monster itself. He's concerned at first, but as the game turns into a more confident, more stronger version of himself, he begins to embrace the side effects. Sally Smith eventually enters the picture, discovering what's been going on and tries to intervene, but Sam starts to transform into the monster again. It tries to take over Sam's mind permanently, but Sally helps him to fight back and send the evil monster spirit back into the game. Sam is back to his old odd self again as he becomes friends with Sally, and they both decide to destroy the game and be done with it for good. But in the final twist, another copy of the game is found in the shelf of another shop. And this is just the tip of the iceberg as I still have plenty more ideas for episodes. We have one where a bunch of old cartoon characters mess around at Les Sally's laptop, 
one where Dart tries to use the Frankenhack monster in his usual pranks, only for the same monster to decide he wants to mess with him instead. And last but not least, my favorite, a unique computer virus turns outdated school technology into. Now, if this does go into production, I hope to be able to produce a season of 20 episodes, 11 minutes each. Maybe two more seasons if this is popular enough. Anyway, this is my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And honestly, I don't think I have anything else to say except thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're too kind. Thank you, Sean. Um, th thanks a million, Sean. Uh, oh, sorry. I that's, that's okay. I'm going to get uh, Suzanne Kelly, please. Suzanne, would you come on and give some commentary on the, on the pitch, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Hi, Sean. How are you? I'm good. Uh, that, nice to meet you, Suzanne. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Can I say, I'm absolutely blown away by your pitch. Just the level of detail, the amount of character design, the amount of thought that you've put into creating this really, really comprehensive world is just incredibly impressive. So I really want to applaud you for that. It's brilliant. So um, obviously you're incredibly interested in, in video games. A little technology. bit. Uh, and, and that's really, I suppose, where all this idea came from. Tell me um, about what's in, in your mind's eye. So you've got your three main characters. They, again, are the driving force of every episode. Is that correct? More or less, uh, like I said, they would be swapping around the roles of the taxes. So one of them would have roles serve as the, the main character and the other two would be as side and supporting characters okay. for some episodes and, uh, and some others they'll swap around, if that makes sense. I love the notion that you have this kind of, you know, typical kind of Irish village that's just being kind of imploded by this huge, big kind of technological kind of crazy city that's just kind of landed in the middle of it, which is fantastic. The, the, the quest that the three characters are on and what, what's their ultimate aim? Is it to kind of bring the, you know, the traditional Irish village back to the way it was and to remove this technology? Are they trying to eradicate it or? or it's or? not, it's not really a quest to reverse the problem as so much as survive their daily surreal life and the um, issues that the errors cause that only they seem to be aware of. I think you've got a really kind of a, a clever concept here, obviously, particularly for this age group, you know, and even younger. You know, technology is just it's just so incredibly there, you know, for everybody to have to deal with. And I think I think what's kind of funny though, and I think for this audience, which might be, you know, a tricky thing to do, is that obviously they're so married to their technology from a very, very early age in terms of phone usage, you know, computers. And I suppose what you're trying to do is I suppose is slightly turn that on its head. Uh, and kind of, I suppose, represent and deliver technology as a kind of an almost a baddie. It, Not necessarily it, a baddie so much as um, sort of highlighted the flaws of when it's misused or misused in the wrong way, or like when you're overly addicted to it, like Sam Stein, or being overly reliant on it, like most children rely on the internet for information and knowledge. This is more about some figuring out the best ways of handling technology so that it doesn't consume you, if that makes sense. So is your plan then, I suppose, from the series by the kids interaction with the technology to kind of try and kind of offer like a resolution, you know, how best for kids to work with technology or how best to use it? Yes, uh, precisely. Well, also doing it in a very funny, surreal, satirical sense of humor. Yeah, and that's, I think that's something that's obviously going to work incredibly well for that audience as well. You know, the, the, the audience that you're pitching it, you know, to, Humor is incredibly important how you deliver it. I think you've got a kind of a nice mix of action, adventure, comedy, which are all, I suppose, key. Uh, in terms of your <clears throat> duration, just let me just check back again. It's 11 minute episodes, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Something went down the wrong way. <laughs> it was, I actually intended it to give me a more 20 minutes, but um, I think when I was doing rehearsals with um, the uh, Shauna, Mark, and uh, Alan, uh, they advised me that um, 11 minutes would be the more preferred format, so... I think 11 is a pretty good duration for you, yeah, yeah. working like that. Because I've seen cartoons uh, with um, episodes that had 11 minutes duration, like the recent uh, Cuphead show on Netflix, and uh, they actually, it, it is possible to get a lot of content into the most limited amount of running time, so I'm definitely up for the challenge, and it is yeah. suitable for the audience. And what I kind of, yeah, I, d I definitely get, I like this notion um, and I've kind of been toying with myself recently, just kind of, you know, almost like a little bit of black mirror for kids, you know? You yes, can... Yeah, it did inspire me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, obviously with the gooey overtones of um, goosebumps as and I like your references as well. You know, you've kind of all, uh, you know, I kind of had a kind of a slightly warped childhood as well. I like kind of dark, you <laughs> know, goosebumps, that type of thing. I think those references yeah. are really good. And I think kids, you know, are always up for kind of that, you know, that edge of spookiness, you know, so it's not too scary. Um, but it's something that they can get involved with and kind of follow the characters really closely. So listen, you did a great, great job. I think the pitch is really cool. Um, it's something I'd like to see more of. I think the character <laughs> worlds are really, really well developed. Um, I suppose the one thing that I will say, I suppose, and this is just from your presentation, which is really great. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of characters um, and, I, and I'm maybe I'm incorrectly calling that out. I'm not sure. Is, is there a huge plethora of characters in your, in your series? And I suppose just maybe you can answer that for me. And if there is, is, you know, again, kind of, you know, going back to a mm. note by one of the um, previous panelists is how then you can kind of get a relationship you know, with these kind of, you know, characters, if there's so many of them within, you know, each single episode, you know, you, there was a panel there you showed with about four or five other characters yeah. as, well, as well, as well as the robot baddies as well, and our three main characters. So it, it, it's, it's a pretty big cast. Is that correct? It is, but um, actually, uh, to be honest, um, outside of one that I had to leave out and another set of monsters, I see uh, at the moment, I only really have a limited set of characters at the moment. I haven't really built up that much to begin with. Only had a basic few for side characters, and you always know, see the ones that are on presentation for main characters. Uh, no, so, it's, my, it's, so my cast yeah, is sorry. No, no, it's just definitely a consideration, I suppose. You know, if you're creating such a kind of a, it is quite a, a detailed world. You know, it's very multi layered with that amount of characters and that amount of adventures that they're going on. It's just a consideration, I suppose, as well. Um, and yeah. again, just in terms of kind of budgetary considerations going forward. But I, I, it's it's really colorful. It's really vibrant and, you know, has the potential to be really exciting. You've already thought out some really good stories. You know, I think you did a great job. Thank you, Suzanne. I really am honored that you would say that. I, uh, and um, thank you so I, much for your kind words and your feedback. I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Look, thanks for a million. It's, uh, it's so interesting. We keep going, but we've got some more pitches. So I'm going to say thank you, Sean. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I'm going to welcome on our next pitch, which is Sheena Walsh. Uh, Sheena, are you with us there? You are? I, think, I am yeah. indeed, yeah. Right. And Sheena's project is called Ten and Pebbles. Best of luck, Sheena. Over to you. Hi there, I'm Sheena from Colossia Dulig. Uh, let me begin my pitch by introducing the real life versions of the two main characters. Uh, they're actually lying behind me right now and I'm hoping they don't show me up. Sorry, Sheena, you might be on mute there again. Apologies about that. Um, I'll just unblur the background. This here is Ted and this is Pebbles. Uh, Pebbles is a little old lady who loves her couch, food and belly rubs. And Ted is a rescue dog. Uh, he's friendly, fun, a fun loving rascal. And he's been with me for almost seven years. They're absolutely brilliant dogs. But uh, when Ted visits my parents' house, it can be another story. So He takes every opportunity to escape their garden, no matter what my dad does to contain him. Uh, this is the garden here, and it may look really nice, self-contained, uh, but, but if you look closer, it's really a fortress full of my dad's handmade attempts to keep him in. He's tried forcing a gate open, He's tried jumping over a hedge. He's tried digging his way through any little hole he can find. When he's led outside to go to the toilet, um, my dad is on constant guard at the kitchen window, hands on his hips, watching Ted circle the perimeter like it's a battle of wits. <laughs> and they're equally matched. Thankfully, when Ted does get out, he does always come back and he runs up to the couch beside Pebbles as if nothing has ever happened. Uh, so I like to imagine what kind of activities they could be getting up to when they're away. And that leads me to the premise of my TV show, Ted and Pebbles. What if each day Ted went out exploring and took a reluctant Pebbles with him on his adventures? The log line could be something like a mischievous dog helped by his clever friend pursues fun in the neighbouring park, always making sure to return home in time for tea. This fast paced fun show would be aimed at six to 11 year olds with 26 episodes at 11 minutes long each. 
This would be Cartoon Ted. Uh, he's sweet and energetic, and before he found his human owner, he was a stray dog and a wandering spirit. Like his real life version, he doesn't take any heed of human boundaries like garden hedges or fences. And this is Cartoon Pebbles. She's been a bit spoilt all her life. She loves her food, her comfort, getting pets. Uh, she's mature and intelligent, and she often helps Ted out of a mess. These two best friends live right beside a public park in an urban city. Uh, there's a secret hole in the fence that they escape through to go off exploring. And a sample episode would go something like this. All the animals in the park are holding their own version of the Olympics. The most prestigious event is a silly walk competition and Magpie is in the lead strutting her stuff. Unfortunately for her, local bully Sid the Seagull is in second place and wants the prize. He gets his minion slug to secretly trip Magpie up mid strut. After the award ceremony, a defeated Magpie, desperate for the shiny cup, asks Ted to recover the trophy that she should have won. He tries but he gets caught and Sid is now on high alert, guarding the cup 24 seven. Frustrated, Magpie insists Ted tries again. Ted refuses, but Magpie threatens to make his human owner aware of the escape route that he uses from the garden if he doesn't. Ted tells Pebbles about this dilemma. Luckily, while out for a walk in another park last week, Pebbles spotted Sid pretending to be a duck and begging for scraps in the pond. Knowing that Sid would be really embarrassed if the others knew he was degrading himself in such a manner, Pebbles tells Ted he just needs to mention the word breadcrumbs and Sid will do exactly what he wants. So Ted goes to Sid all bravado, but before he can get the cup, Magpie swoops down and steals it. A chase ensues between Sid, Magpie and Ted as Pebbles looks on unimpressed. Paint buckets are knocked over, a lawnmower swerves and goes out of control, a human yoga instructor looking to get closer to nature screams for the disruptive animals to be removed from her sight. Eventually the trophy falls into the arms of a child who whisks it away, leaving all the animals empty handed with a trail of destruction in their wake. Sid is furious, but when Ted mentions breadcrumbs, he's forced to apologise to everyone. Ted and Pebbles return home and lie on the couch to think about the day's events. Pebbles suggests that Ted shouldn't meddle so much in other people's business, but oblivious to this, Ted reveals he actually made the Olympic trophy himself from silver sweet wrappers. And there actually is loads of them in the bin beside them, making all the drama of the day totally pointless. While humans feature in minor roles, uh, the focus is on Ted, Pebbles and friends. And from the animal's point of view, the only thing we see of their owner is a set of legs or an arm. So the theme of the show is about being yourself and the humour that comes uh, uh, from how the animals interact with each other and from the trouble they have being a little wild while boxed into a human park that's controlled by humans. Or sorry, a par an urban park that's controlled by humans. Uh, so that's it. And thanks very much for listening to my pitch. And Pebbles is actually being the bold one now by making all the noise in the background. So Ted's off the hook. Thanks, Sheena. Thanks, thanks for the pitch. Uh, great stuff. Nice to see a bit of interaction with the dogs as well. Um, so I'm just going to ask Adina Pitt of Warner Media Kids and Family to uh, review your project. Sheena, thank you so much. I don't know if you noticed, but all of the dog lovers as soon as you unblurred your background, everybody was like this and, and completely hooked. Uh, I think that this IP has just an inherent sweetness and a humor baked into it. And I understood that from the get-go. Did have a few comments for you and, and a couple questions, but one of them is the target demo. It seems like a missed opportunity to not go slightly younger and make it more bridge than six to 11 because I actually think that the viewers are gonna be younger than the six to 11. And I think you could, you could exaggerate the stories to such an extent that the younger viewer would really be hooked. And obviously that, that might uh, involve more concern about standards and practices and things that go along with targeting a younger demo. But I, I think that that would be something worth exploring creatively. 
Question for you. Is this intended to be a hybrid show with the animated characters on a live action back, background? Is that what you're doing? That, that would be the intention, yes. Um, I suppose the point of that, in a way, um, depending on budget, of course, but the point of that would be, I suppose, to have a contrast between the kind of human world that they're in and then the life of the animals as well in 2D, um, you know, and all the anim animation kind of happening in the two-dimensional. Two I think, I think that's really, really, really cool. And I would just say that if that is indeed the case, and even if it were fully animated, I would just say you have such a special idea here. And I know it's a first pass, but I would love to see that artwork be elevated a little bit more, maybe another pass at the visuals, because I think when we look at your pets, right? And I know that, that they're your real dogs, you just... I, I want to feel a little more texture in the animals and you can even go super comedic with the way they're designed, you know, very cartoony, but I feel like, I feel like they are, it's a great start. And I would just, you know, uh, maybe take another pass at that and make them feel super, super amplified. So if, if the contrast with the live action will be even funnier if you, if you are able to, to explore that. And I think, you know, the, the last thing that I would say is, um, I'm wondering if there's a, what we call the stealing from Comedy Central, the kill Kenny moment, you know, how in every episode they kill Kenny. Is there something that, you know, you said that one of your pets is always trying to escape. I don't remember if it was Ted or if it was Pebbles. I think it was Ted, right? Ted. Uh, is there something that if Ted is, is, is an animal who's trying, always trying, is there one thing that he tries to do he fails miserably in every episode? It might be a fun thing to explore because kids will wait for it. And it, in every story, it's just like, oh, there goes Ted again. He failed again or whatever. He couldn't escape again or something about Ted that is so true to his nature of trying to whether it's escape or, or prank or do whatever he's doing, I think that would be a really fun, creative exploration for you. And I don't know who I'm supposed to throw to. Is it you, Peter? If you wanna say anything? If we, if we have a quick question, Peter, maybe. Um, no, look, Adina covered it all. I, I, I have to admit the one thing I did during the pitch that I shouldn't have done was I was texting the Nahana picture of my dog because <laughs> I, I, we all, we all have that emotional connection and it's really deep. So I think it's a wonderful starting place. And I agree with Adina, the more, especially on the design side, the more you can evolve those designs to make you feel as emotionally connected to the design of the dogs as you feel to your own dogs, that will be the biggest win for this, but it's a really great start. The karma of all that is my dog's name is Ted. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sheena. Thanks, Adina. And thanks, Peter. Um, and I'm just going to keep moving along. We've got Shannon, Shanna Gannon of uh, with Captain's Log. Uh, Shannon, Shanna, are you there? Sorry, it's Alan Shannon and Shanna Gannon. We've been doing this for the last couple of weeks and it's confusing me. Uh, so, Shanna, are you there? I'm not getting Shanna at the moment. Okay, um, do you know, we can move to Derry Luttrell. We'll just come back to Shanna, if that's okay. Um, Derry, is Derry there? We're having one of these, anyone there moments? <laughs> um, we may have some tech issues there. So anyone else want to talk about dogs? I'm good with dogs. I've got a dog myself. That was my actual story that I have two dogs. This, one of them spends all of its time trying to escape. My husband is constantly out there, like Sheena's dad, making sure they can't and nailing things down and bodging things together. And the big dog is too stupid to have thought of escaping. It's the little one that's the evil mastermind, the brain of Pinky and the brain. And I just, I wonder what they, where they think they're going. But look, there is here, everybody. Hooray. Excellent. Th thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So much. Derry Luttrell, and Derry is going to pitch his show, which is called Frankie and Phantomia. So over to you, Derry. Thank you, and best of luck. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Derry Luttrell, and I'm here to pitch my cartoon, Frankie and Phantomia, a story about a normal little girl and her paranormal best friend learning that it's okay to be a little weird. I hope you all enjoy the spectacular ahead of you all. 
So without further ado, let's get the show on the road. Now, Frankie here is a normal little girl. She has a normal family. She lives in a normal house and goes to a normal school. In fact, the only thing that isn't normal about Frankie is her best friend in the world, Fantamia. Because Fantamia is a ghost. A spooky specter who lives in the rickety old haunted house next door. Frankie and Fantamia are total opposites to each other. But not necessarily in the way you might expect. Because see, while Frankie is an excitable and energetic young lady, Fantamia is quiet, shy, and honestly kind of a scaredy cat. But that's really why these two are best friends. Despite being complete opposites to each other, they always have each other's backs at the end of the day. Of course, Fantamia does not live in that house alone. She has a whole family of ghastly ghouls. Uh, her dad is a blood-sucking lawyer. Her big sister is always on her shell phone. Her mommy is a mummy. And her brother is a real wild animal. Their lives are totally different to Frankie's. They come out at night. They eat strange food. They wear odd clothes. But at the same time, Frankie's life is really strange to them. School, airplanes, ham sandwiches, all these things that we take for granted are bizarre to them. So I want to give a little backstory as to why I am making Frankie and Fantomia. Uh, first things first, when I was a kid, I was mad into the spooky stuff. Ghostbusters, Scooby-Doo, Ruby Gloom, The Addams Family. If you can name it, I watched it. I loved watching these, not quite scary, but spooky TV shows because they made me feel really cool and grown up. They didn't feel like they were just for kids, but they also made scary things a little less scary which I appreciate because it was as cool as it is to feel grown up, it's also cool not to be very scared. Maybe more personally though, the big reason I wanna make this show is because I want a show where kids are not embarrassed about their lives. I'm half Swiss and when I was a kid, I did not talk about that. Um, I didn't want my friends knowing because I thought if they knew, they would think I was weird. They'd think I would sat home eating cheese all day. That was different. So I just stayed quiet. That all changed one day when I invited my friends over for lunch and my mum made, of all things, a cheese fondue. And I was like, oh no, this is the end of the world. My friends are going to think I'm weird. They loved it. It was all they talked about for a week. And that was like a real light bulb moment for me. Um, I realized that even if it were weird, it's also really cool to be yourself, you know, to like be proud of the things you have. And that's exactly what Frankie and Fantomia is about. It's a show about being proud of who you are and not being worried about being strange. Neither of these guys are more normal than the other. What's weird to Fantomia isn't to Frankie and vice versa. If anything, the kids' weirdness are the best things about them. And hopefully that'll help a lot of kids realize, just like I did, that being weird is one of the best things you can be. As such, episodes can be about either character learning more about each other's weird lives. For example, one episode is about... Uh, Frankie being invited over for dinner one day and trying stranger and stranger foods and Fantomia getting embarrassed over it, even though Frankie's totally into it. Another episode might be about Fantomia following Frankie to school one day and almost getting into a lot of trouble when she accidentally haunts the classroom. But here is a pitch for an episode where Frankie and Fantomia try to fix a mistake before they're caught. So it is another beautiful day and Frankie is coming over to hang out with Fantomia. The two decide that they want to read some books today, so Fantomia takes Frankie to the family's haunted library. Fantomia sits down and starts to read, and Frankie explores, intrigued by how different everything is. Books float from one shelf to another and have weird names written in strange glyphs. Kind of curious, Frankie picks up a book and starts leafing through it. It's a spell book, so just before she does something she maybe shouldn't, Fantomia's dad pops up behind her, takes the book, and is like, ah, the spell book here is not for children. He asks Frankie to go read a safe book with Fantomia. Fantomia happily obliges, picks out her mom's favorite book, The Mummy Princess's Tale, and she's about to open it, but as soon as she does, the pages just turn into dust. Fantomia panics. Oh no, she's broken her mom's favorite book. The two run upstairs trying to ask Fantomia's brother and sister for help. Wilfred says he's pretty sure that it's a really old book and, you know, mom loved it a lot. And Fishbell adds that, yeah, unless you can do magic or something, there's no way to fix this, so just tell mom. That, however, gives Frankie an idea. What if they did do magic? That spellbook downstairs, there must be a way to fix this in the spellbook. 
So the two sneak downstairs and take the book and start flipping through it. And inside they find a way to fix the situation, a spell called Conjure Books. That should do be the trick. However, when Frankie and Fantomia are reading it, Fantomia starts to worry. She knows some recipes for the spell, like Eye of Newt and Tongue of Frog, but others she's never heard of, like dish soap and turmeric. Luckily, Frankie's here and she knows where they can get some, the local shop. They dress Fantomia up in an, a disguise so that she doesn't scare people too badly when they go out shopping and start going to find all the ingredients. Of course, that being said, Fantomia still has a kind of hard time blending in. She floats up to the top shelf while looking for ingredients. She phases through walls. She even levitates the shopping instead of putting into a bag. Thankfully, though, the two are able to get home unscathed and start casting the spell. But just as they finish the spell, disaster strikes because instead of conjuring a book, it summons a load of crows. Oh, it says conjure rook, not conjure book. Having heard the commotion, Fantomia's mom runs in and asks what's going on. The two girls own up to everything, from breaking the book to doing the spell to summoning all these crows. They're ready to get into a lot of trouble, but Fantomia's mom doesn't mind. She tells them that they shouldn't have done the spell because doing magic on your own is very dangerous, but it's okay that they broke the book. These things happen, and the book was also very, very old. It was going to happen one way or another. She tells them that they'll all do the spell together later, but to always remember, ask a parent when you need help. They all hug and everything's great. Then Frankie asks, so are we going to do anything about the crows? And the episode closes on a real commotion coming in from the next room over. So there we have it, everyone. Frankie and Fantomia, a normal girl and her paranormal friend learning that it's okay to be a little weird. Uh, aimed at kids between 6 to 11 years old with episodes about 11 minutes long. Hope you all enjoyed this walk on the spooky side with me and remember to be weird too. Thank you, Derry. Thanks very much. That was great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to get Sarah Muller from BBC to come and give you your project a review. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was brilliant, Derry. What good fun. And I have to say, I've so enjoyed these little glimpses into everybody's lives. I want to go to that fondue party. That looks so <laughs> cool. Um, I can't because I'm vegan, so I can't eat the cheese. But just it felt like a really immersive and personal moment that really gives us an insight into how you're thinking and what your inspiration was. I just want to talk very quickly about, yes, how kids do love spooky. And it's something we're all looking for. It's a bit of a grail getting just the right level of scaredness mm -hmm. with humor with recognizable characters because actually it's there's a serious developmental element to it kids mm -hmm. need to test themselves it's quite well recorded that we need to give children opportunities to test their boundaries to see how far they can go but to do that in a safe space and it's really very important it's all to do with growing up so that's why we're all drawn to things that are a bit on the edge so yeah. excellent Lovely things, weird but cool to be yourself, be proud of who you are, some really strong themes in there. But if we start, and I liked all the normal tropes with the twist thing, so all the things it means to be a family, but because they're a family that are different, they do mm -hmm. things differently. And I guess that's where your, your Swiss story comes in as well, you know, really understanding that. I'm going to suggest mm -hmm. that you need to do quite a bit of character development. Now, I know you haven't had very long to pitch. This is quite nerve-wracking, but it feels quite story-driven. And I, what I think you absolutely need here is for your characters to really be the author of their own destinies within this. And that way you can tell multiple stories. You can really push the comedy, the weirdness, but it just, you've really got to sit down and get under the, bonnet of what could some of the people here will say I think sorry mm -hmm. um of what makes those characters tick and what their relationships are to each other because ultimately while it's about Frankie our focus is I think going to be on that family because I think we all wished we could have known a family like that they they just seem really fun and cool mm -hmm. so really understanding that dynamic um I found myself musing about 
um, Frankie's own home life and whether we see that and why she's so drawn to spend all this time with Phantom Phantomia. Phantomia. It's like Mia Phantomia. with Phantom Star. Yeah. <laughs> is it because her own family are desperately dull? It, you know, <laughs> what is the attraction? Um, I wondered, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where I got to yet. Maybe we could talk about it further another yeah, time. Sure. Whether or not you need to understand why she's always with them and where she's come from, or whether mm. or not that's just part of your character development that you don't need to really talk about. But you know when you're planning out scripts and mm. working on your ideas, because you know who she is very firmly and why she's there and what her background is, that will help inform how she behaves. So it might be either, I don't know. But you've got a very strong core group there. I mean, I'm delighted you, that you are drawing on your, you've got some great re iconic reference in there. You could have a bit more of a look, to be honest. I think a lot of things are referential in a reverential way that we all mm -hmm. like, where we've all based things on stories we enjoyed ourselves as children, then take them forward into our, our grown-up creative lives. So you could have a bit of a look at how some of those characters interact, particularly in the monsters, which is very well defined and feels like a grouping that would be useful to mine. Um, I'm interested in the colour palette. I think that might be something. I, I think I know what you're getting at because it's quite ethereal and it'll make Phantomia feel translucent and, and wispy. Mm -hmm. But have you thought about any other colours? It felt quite subdued throughout. And there's a lot of fun and joy in this. What was your thinking there, Derry? Uh, the reason I went with that is because, um, yeah, like you said, I wanted to be translucent. But that being said, I don't think it has to be set in stone. Um, like evolving it to make it maybe more like a brighter colour rather than like these subdued ones is 100% on the table. Um, I, I think really... I liked having those kind of more subdued colors, but like obviously when it goes into production, that will probably get changed a lot because, you know, I'm here not necessarily having worked with uh, like TV productions before. So if someone says, you know, this could do a little more saturation, we could have a little more color rather than uh, sticking with a more limited palette. Mm -hmm. That's a hundred percent on the table. Yeah. Okay. And um, also give Frankie a point of difference if she, like she feels like she's rooted somewhere else. If you gave mm -hmm. a slightly different colour palette, might be a thing. I also made an like idea. Sarah, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Apologies, um, we're running low on time here. Maybe you guys can pick it up afterwards. But um, I'm gonna sure. try. Uh, a, sorry, thank you, Derry, and thank thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm gonna try to get Shanna Gannon back on. Uh, is Shanna there now? Great, we have Shanna. Uh, Shanna Gannon is uh, her project is called Captain's Log. So over to you, Shanna, and best okay. of luck. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Shana Gannon, and I'm here to pitch my series idea, Captain's Log. I'm an international student from New York with an illustration degree from FIT and I'll soon have an animation degree from BCFE here in Ireland. I'm constantly traveling to see my family and to go to school, which is what blossomed the show idea. Captain's Log follows the journey of our bold seagull captain and his pigeon companion Breezy as they give the audience a tour of countries around the world. Aimed towards preschool aged children, each seven minute episode has Captain teaching us the similarities and differences of the episode's country compared to the rest of the world. This aims to expose young children to travel, cultural differences and diversity. Captain puts up a front of being posh and has a big ego acting out everything he says, whether it be snatching frog legs from a tourist in France, accidentally ruining a carnival float in Brazil, or dropping paint colors on people during Holly in India, his acts of mischief, despite his bravado, are just minor inconveniences. He takes on the bigger brother role to Breezy and helps them in a pickle. Breezy is a clumsy and adorable little pigeon that's always in the right place at the right time. 
wherever Captain decides to go, Breezy is already there getting love from the locals and stealing Captain's spotlight. Though Breezy doesn't have the level of knowledge Captain has, they'd like to take it easy and stop to smell the flowers, giving the audience a different calm perspective. Every episode starts with Captain and Breezy on the cruise ship they call home. This ship has always seen bustling with birds and people as Captain and Breezy prepare for their next adventure. Some episodes will feature local birds who can provide a more personal perspective on the day-to-day -day life of the region's people and animals. Captain will often form a friendly rivalry with these local birds as he tries to show off his own knowledge of the local culture. Despite his jealousy of the love Breezy gets, Captain takes on the big brother role and tells them to stay safe on the cruise ship. Though his words of caution are often ignored, this sometimes works well for Captain as he uses Breezy to distract the locals in order to get into high security places or swipe some local cuisine. Captain is often worried sick and will overexert himself if it looks like Breezy will get hurt or is in trouble, but they always figure it out eventually. The world itself has a very distinct look, making the skylines and colors pop as their own illustrations in very straight lines and textured brushes. Leaning heavily into color theory and mood lighting will give it a unique look against other young children's shows, helping it to stand out. The more abstract color theory also allows the show to convey the local cultures and late landscapes in a way that is informative but attention grabbing and memorable to young children. The state, country, or, or county flags of the area are used in the background colors as well. A possible episode idea would be Captain and Breezing ar arriving to New York City on New Year's Eve. Captain wants to teach the audience about specific landmarks like the Statue of Liberty, Broadway, and Central Park, while Breezy admires the decorations and strolls along. Then, when Captain starts getting tired, he decides to show us the subway system. He tries walking into a subway car, but is promptly kicked out by the screaming subway people. He looks back and is shocked to see Breezy still in the subway car, and the doors close and the train leaves. Captain freaks out, rushing through other landmarks to try and find his friend, like the Bronx Zoo, before plopping down in front of the TV store defeated. There, he can see the New Year's Eve ball drop on TV, with Breezy on top of the ball. Captain flies over and starts arguing with them, stomping down on the ball and accidentally making it go from 50 seconds to zero. The crowd goes silent before erupting in joy for the new year. Captain takes a moment to bow to the crowd before hearing the horn of their ship, which always signals when it's time to leave. As Captain and Breezy make their way back to the ship, Captain looks to the camera and says, the best thing about the New Year's celebration in New York City is that it brings the whole city together. Through some harmless mischief, good-natured fun, and an eagerness to learn and teach, Captain and Breezy show that the world is full of wonderful places and people, and we should celebrate and share our differences. With colorful visuals and exciting adventures, Captain's Log offers its audience a unique perspective on the world from a bird's eye view. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Thanks very much. Lovely presentation. Um, I'm going to ask Ryan Ross from Disney EMEA to join us, please. Thanks for thanks for the pitch, Jonna. Um, and I, I had some sort of, sort of immediate questions for you, um, uh, just so I can understand kind of what you're you're getting at. Um, you you sort of mentioned that that Captain is like his mission is to teach the audience. So is he yeah. is he speaking to the audience throughout? Like, let me show you this, and I'll take you over yes. here. Okay. Yes, he's so talking to the audience in a way that's he'll pull his flapper up to show something behind him or things like that. 
Okay, so yeah. he's he's like talking to the camera, like it's there with him, and he's he's kind of showing him around, right? Yeah. He's, he's sort of showing everybody around. I mean, he's a really fun character. I liked how you described him as being sort of boastful and energetic, and always throwing himself into things. And it's a nice odd couple dynamic that you have um, with Breezy, and it and 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 seeing them all over the world and getting into adventures with grapes feels it feels it feels like it could be could be really fun. Um, I, I guess I would just question whether you, whether you, you you really need them to be to be explicitly teaching, uh, you know, or, or whether it should just be a be a kind of fun adventure that happens to teach in the background. Some it's some sometimes the sort of teaching mission may be more effective if you're not kind of uh, r- reaching out and hitting people over the head with it, right? Because it you're, you're going to sort of get it anyway. Um, yeah. Or maybe you need some other sort of device uh, about why he's talking to the camera or something like that. But there is what's cool. And and what's cool about this and what I think is really fresh and original is that, you know, a seagull and a pigeon are they're everywhere. Right. They they are because when you're doing a tourist show, the problem is always like, well, where you come from. If you're talking about difference, difference only matters based on what your perspective is and where you come from. So if you're a visitor in a city, you know, you're going to see it differently from if you live in that city. But with with a pigeon and a seagull, you kind of get around that in an interesting way because they sort of belong nowhere and everywhere and belong to everybody. They're kind of universal. And, and that's something that's something sort of fun to explore. They are kind of as species, they're sort of like citizens of the world in a really fun way. I would, I'd spend some more time working on that, right? And and mm-hmm. and maybe getting away from just the, uh, maybe maybe just moving away from from the teaching part of it, um, and just have that there in the background, you know, because because but if they always happen to be in a in a new city at the most exciting time like when the ball is dropping on new year's eve in new york then that that's just fun and that, and that's that's just the excitement the the exciting and heightened world of the show um which which i think is which i think is really fun um why did you why why do you think a, a, a cruise ship is a good base for them because that would give them a sort of hub world and they're not right. constantly flying everywhere because as soon as they warped, land, they'd already be tired. It, it does so. kind of give you a warped perspective. If you live your whole life on a cruise ship, you're going to be experiencing the world in a very strange way, yeah. right? <laughs> and maybe, and if that's where you want to go, then go with it, right? Then when they're looking at difference, they're always comparing it to like, well, we don't have this on the ship, you know? So maybe yeah. we've got, <laughs> right? This isn't how it works on a cruise ship. This is how it doesn't work on the Fiesta deck, you know? Mm. So that it's that's an interesting sort of cultural frame of reference for them to come from, right? To, to go out, to mm-hmm. go out and explore things. I think it's, you, you want to find a way to go beyond just the tourist view though, right? And what you get with what you get with a cruise ship and what you get with them just calling in at a port, it's a very sort of postcard, superficial kind of engagement with places that you're going. And I would push a little deeper into saying, you know, does it always have to be the Rio Carnival and and the New York New Year's Eve? And what are the more surprising things that that you could discover in these places that go? May, and maybe the cruise ship will push you only to the really obvious tourist destination things, right? And, and actually, the fun of it because you've got a seagull and a pigeon, and they kind of go everywhere and they belong everywhere. Maybe there's maybe there's a way just to just 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 to go to that next level. You know, because when you when you travel, if you go to the place where the cruise ship docks, it's always the most boring place. You have to go. You have to drive another 50 miles. Right. To get somewhere really cool or interesting. Right? Mm-hmm. So what is that? What is that next? I think and I think even for I think even for preschoolers and even for young kids, if you're going to do something like this. You know, try and try and go that extra extra step with it. But I think. Building it around this odd couple of this really fun odd couple of a seagull and a pigeon is a, is a great start. And Cap- Captain is a, is just a really fun character, and I you know you kind of want to follow him everywhere. Um, That's so great. yeah, uh, thanks, Ryan. Sorry, um, and thanks, Shanna, uh, for a great presentation. Um, Thank you. That, that concludes the pitches for this event. Um, so I just want to say thanks to all the judges and all the pitchers. Uh, I think you'll agree they all did a wonderful job today and each project has huge potential. 
and we can't wait to see who's won this year's The Big Picture 2022. Um, with that in mind, we're going to ask our panel of judges to enter the breakout room and confer and discuss all the projects in more detail. Um, Dale Return announced the winner uh, of the event. So thank you guys, we'll see, we'll see you shortly. Um, in the meantime, while the judges are discussing the projects and making their choices, we have a short visi video presentation for your viewing pleasure. Um, as this is the fifth year of the big picture, we're gonna share a compilation of the previous panelists and winners in action. Uh, we hope you enjoy the presentation and we look forward to having you back in about 10 minutes or so um, and we'll have the announcement of this year's winner. So stay tuned and we'll see you guys shortly. Take care. And they're gonna come up here and they're going to pitch their ideas. Uh, that's really scary. I'm nervous for them. So when they come up, we're gonna give them oceans of love. And if they stop at any point in their pitch, that's okay. We'll let them regain their composure and get on with it. Thanks. <laughs> I just want a character that has no empathy for these dark wizards and then she meets, this little light comes into her life and it just takes her by storm. I, I wasn't sure, does everyone know about the secret who works in the office? Yeah. That's the bit I wasn't clear about. And then, um, just people that work overtime. Well, as I said, I was trying to keep it flexible. I, I'm fine with any age rating if I can make it. Yeah. Uh, yeah if, and, and that people don't give kids enough credit. I watched Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid, and I was never <laughs> <laughs> OK, Al, any questions about the space pirates and uh, their daughter? Um, sorry, I missed the age group you were going for. What was the age group? 7 to 15. 7 to 15. 10 to 15. 10 to 15. 10 to 15. Great. So I've always been told by people in the industry to create something that you love. That way it won't be a chore and you'll always be interested in it. So it's no wonder that the pact was born due to my interest in elderly men, alcohol, and death. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's my fit. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to be friends with everyone. He's, he's a fun, fun loving guy like now. The winner is Crater Lake. All finalists did rather well. Yeah. So, well done. Josh has come back again. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Except for you, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's just done so, so well. So yeah. impressive. We just speak clearly and slowly. Because we're Irish, we can speak a little bit fast. Most of the changes are, are either from the US, and we're off from the US. UK, US, US, and there's yeah. something Al, Al. 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 That guy Al. 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 Al will laugh at anything. So, <laughs> he's on your side. So, uh, on to, on to our, our next pa panel, which is the big picture. Um, sponsored by Jam Media and Cartoon Springboard. A uh, very special prize for the winner. We've got Two two uh, two phase prize. We got six months paid internship in Jam for the winner. Uh, during their time in Jam, they'll be mentored and how to refine their pitch. And <laughs> Billy won't be there, so partial torture. Uh, so you'll be mentored on how to refine the pitch and get it ready for um, Cartoon Springboard, and then you'll be travelling to France in December to Cartoon Springboard to pitch your idea to industry professionals. Um, and your peers alike. So, best of luck. Um, wish everyone a look and big round of applause for everyone brave enough to up here. So basically when I started to think about what I wanted to develop for the big picture here, I decided pretty early on I wanted to do a preschool show. And from there I started to think about, you know, some of the fears you have as kids and sort of made me think back on me when I was about four or five. Sorry, one second, I'm just gonna finish this page. <laughs> Sorry, I was just lost. I was just lost in a good book. Don't you just love how otters can take you to a whole new world? Sorry, my name is Noel, by the way. That's me. Um, so, um, my work is highly confidential, though. So I'm going to ask that nobody here take any photographs of the images shown on screen here today, as it's highly sensitive material. I'd also ask that before you leave today, you all sign non-disclosure agreements. <laughs> 
you know, sometimes uh, kids would not yet understand what anger is. And that was the main idea for this show. Um, I've loved cartoons ever since I was tiny. And I've loved cartoons in particular that I could relate to as a girl. Um, so basically, um, I, my parents didn't pay for Sky when I was a kid, so I just had RTE2. I had TG Cahar, but I couldn't speak Irish and I was crap at it, so we had RTE2. And these were what I watched. I loved Brace Face, Kim Possible, Proud Family. I'm sure you remember it. Um, loved Pepper Ann, because she was useless at everything as well, and I really identified with that. He's actually pretty cool with the whole being dead thing. He's generally pretty cool with anything. He's just sort of there. He's flowing through life. He doesn't, he's not entirely sure what he wants to do with himself. Uh, he's a bit, he's, he lacks kind of assertion. He's a bit spineless. Do, 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 do. Monster Hounds from Josh O'Quiz. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the 2019 Big Picture and I can guarantee you we've got six fantastic pitches here today uh, from some of the most creative talents uh, coming up. So like the last couple of years, right, uh, the two winners, they both had costumes, so like I feel this will improve my chances by like 30% at least. <laughs> so um, my name, regrettably, is Josef Alvarez Schützenhofer. That's why everyone calls me Louie. She's very curious, and a lack of answers puts me into problem-solving mode. Uh, she is always determined to figure things out for herself. On her time travel adventures, she uses a combination of her clever mind and enthusiasm to overcome challenges. Her innocence also plays a role in her success, because sometimes she unknowingly foils a villain's plans. Doris is the wild card of the team. Emphasis on the wild. She's bleeding mad. Uh, then there's Rat. <laughs> uh, Rat has a very complicated relationship with the team. Sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad. Uh, the team always forgive him, but sometimes it doesn't work out. It keeps, I wanted to keep a consistency between everything. And so it allows me to tell stories in more outworldly places. So the world is very bleak. It's um, made up of all sorts of environments that will keep the show visually fresh and exciting, like from tundras to deserts to flying cities. You can see off on the left there, a big circle around it. Since and Earth is very hot, um, they have the ability to contract their spacesuit into a comfortable, casual outfit, just like my own. Um, she's very driven, she has high expectations of herself, and she considers herself to be very mature but that's up for debate. Yeah. This brought me to the world of how so many animals existed beyond my imagination, and this all started from TV. Uh, so I grew up again, <laughs> and I was torn between becoming a vet and a storyteller. Obviously, I chose the latter, and yet I always wondered how I could help my animal friends beyond the enclosure of my sketch pad and my pencil. And the, the results are in, so our distinguished jury have, have, uh, have announced uh, who they think is the winner of Big Picture 2019. And it is Debbie Tan with Hannah's Ark! Come up here, Debbie Tan! <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, yeah, thanks. Uh, I really like to thank my lecturers and all because honestly, I, vo I just volunteered last year, so I knew of the big pitches existence, but I had no clue how it actually ran. So I'd like to give a shout out to my lecturers and my friends at the back. I teach Lee. So a typical episode would consist of Nola and Lou venturing through these forest rivers and facing a different challenge or creature in each one. Each episode introduces a new ghost along with new problems to solve, whether it be the work of said ghost or the general trouble found in a harsh world. Um, and I'm usually an animator, but today I'm a researcher as I've made quite the discovery. Now what's inside this box is fantastical. So how did this world, so mind altering, that for those that are faint of heart, I suggest you look away from the screen right now. 
What? You in the audience? A regular can? No! Concrete Jungle is about a native Amazonian child named Pedro. Pedro is the Amazon's only hope for survival. He must find the courage to fight against the invaders who are destroying his home. Although the fight is jeopardized by ruthless leader Hogan, and Pedro is left to explore the concrete jungle, meeting new friends along the way. Um, the story is told episodically, so we, um, which has deep character-driven lore-based episodes with the overarching goal of making it the King Ballo's domain and saving Dara. Uh, Hinterlands is a low fantasy 10-part series with a target audience of 10 years and up. Each episode will be 15 minutes long. My goal is to create a series that tackles difficult themes like loss and loneliness and mental health in a hopeful, creative way that seems accessible for kids without coming across as like too dark or bleak. Normal humans like you and me and humans who evolve from fallen stars. Nova is half star person and half human person. As a vocabulary um, add in, star people are referred to as astronas. Earth humans are referred to as Voasks, and half Estrelna, half Voask are called Sedelnas. Enzo, uh, he's a forgetful elephant who remembers the important things. Uh, I'd like to make this into an animated short, so the duration will be about four minutes. Um, so let me tell you a story, and thank you for the opportunity. The other co-protagonist is Siu, a short black-haired female gamer from South Korea. She was close to a video gaming younger older brother who serves in the army but died in battle, which made her quiet, reserved, and rarely showing emotion, but begins to open up after mean Arlo. Next up, we have the captain's parents. So we have Mama and Papa Smooth. Mama is the former captain aboard a pirate ship called the Bookworm, and she used to travel the world looking for new books. Um, so there was one pitch which floated to the top for us and was filled with with promise and the beginnings of a beautiful world created and uh, beautiful themes and congratulations that is nova which is Kristen hennessy <laughs> oh, congratulations oh i'm so i'm so sorry i'm genuinely floored by that <laughs> oh, well done Kristen. Hi and welcome back. We, we hope you enjoyed the presentation of our past pictures. Um, it's amazing to see the contributions again and the evolution of the event over the last five years. Can you believe it's five years? So I'd like to bring back our chairman of the judging panel, Mr. Alan Shannon of John Media, to announce this year's winner of the big picture. Alan? Thanks, Mark. And uh, great job of emceeing once again. Well done. Um, and uh, firstly, I'd like to commend and congratulate all of the participants. I thought they were all amazing. So well done. And um, you should be very proud of yourselves and um, you did a great job. All the pitches were really strong and um, yeah, you should be very proud. Um, it's a very intimidating thing to do in front of your peers, but especially in front of these industry giants. Um, but uh, it's and it was great to see um, earlier on all of the alumni of uh, the big picture and, and where they've gone to and, and the, how watching their careers develop. So the judges deliberated and had a um, lively conversation about all of the projects. And I can say that it was very close, very, very close in the, indeed. But the winner of this year's big picture is Little Scouts by Siobhan Katanu. So well done, Siobhan. Brilliant job. And the, and the judges thought it was really well developed and thought out. And um, I'll I might uh, go to you now, Siobhan, if you, have a, if you have a few words to say. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm kind of in shock, but I'm delighted. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity and for seeing the potential in my pitch. Uh, I'm over the moon. <laughs> well done. Well deserved. Um, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and well done to all of the other participants. They were, they were amazing as well. As I said, it was very close. Um, but you, you pipped them at the post, Siobhan. So well done. And we, we'll, we'll see you soon in Jan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. guys. And thanks to all the judges 
uh, for for giving their valuable time as well. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I'll hand you back to Mark now, who will close the show. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks a million, thanks, Alan. Uh, congratulations, Siobhan, uh, and your show, Little Scout. Hopefully, we'll see a lot more of it. Um, I just want to thank everyone who took part, including our six pitchers. Thanks to our judging panel. Thanks to Jam Media for providing the internship. Thanks to Cartoon Springboard, who will host today's winner at their event in Madrid, in Spain, in October. Uh, thanks to Scott, Tiago, Shauna and Miguel for the huge contributions that they've been working into the wee hours this morning uh, to make, make sure that this event and all the other events of Animation Dingo ran so smoothly. So thank you, guys. Um, thanks to all the guys and the crew at Animation Dingo and all the crew in Jam Media who made this panel possible. Um, finally, thanks to our sponsor, which is Jam Media again, sounds a bit weird. But thank you, everyone. Uh, and congratulations to Siobhan. And we look forward to seeing you all again next year at the Big Picture. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.